The title of the sermon this morning is The Night of the Unbeliever. The Night of the Unbeliever. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for everything that you have done so far. We have heard what you've been doing with your people. Now I'm just asking, Lord, that one more time you use this broken vessel to preach your word. And I'm asking all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I love words, and that came from my mother. She used to say to my sister and myself, we may not have much, but the one thing that people cannot take away from you is knowledge. So my sister and I would always have a dictionary close to us. And when we heard a word that we did not recognize, we would open the dictionary. And this word, unbeliever, has an associated word or a synonym, and it is infidel. And I'm like, what does that word mean? Because I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, at the unbeliever, and then the Lord put my, you know, my, my eyes right to that synonym, infidel. It means one who is not a Christian or who opposes Christianity. An unbeliever there goes the word, with respect to a particular religion or one who acknowledged no religious belief. This is where my friend is. Or a disbeliever in something specified or understood. A disbeliever in something specified or understood. But even with all of these definitions, I'm telling my friends, you know, God loves unbelievers. God loves unbelievers, and some of them are going to see the light, like you're doing right now. Some of them actually are just waiting for Christians to live what they profess. And some of them are just going to be saved, amen? One of the greatest unbelievers in the past was Bob Ingersoll, known as the great agnostic. He was always trying to discredit the Lord. He entered into this conspiracy with Lou Wallace, a novelist, and he said to Wallace, I want you to write a story about Jesus and make it authentic in in every detail so that people will believe in it, except one thing, involve Jesus in a scandal. Perhaps with Mary Magdalene. Have you heard of that? You think that's new? And if you write that story, and if it is true in every respect, and you add a little ingredient, then people will lose their faith in Christ. And Lou Wallace decided to do just that. But like many good writers, he knew if he was actually going to write something that it was going to make it true in every detail, he had to study And he began to study the Gospels about Jesus. And he found the pearl of great price. And his heart was changed. And instead of writing what Ingersoll wanted him to write, he wrote the classic Ben-Hur, where Christ is lifted up as our Savior. Compassionate, glorious, powerful. Jesus will save unbelievers. But this morning I want to I want to place the emphasis on this business of doubt and fear to obey. And the idea that God's word cannot be trusted. And I want to tell you one reason why the devil attacks the Bible. First of all, it is the only, it is only, excuse me, through the Bible that Christ is revealed as man's hopes of eternal salvation. You see, if you don't get it from the Bible, you don't get it from any other source. Amen? I know, you're, I know you're tired. I know it's been long, but now it's my time. You guys have your time? I need to have mine. <laughs> and the devil knows that if he can destroy or discredit the Bible in our minds, we, can, we will not find Christ. And it, it, that's the dirtiest trick that he's pulling off nowadays. He's attacking the Bible because as Jesus said in John 17, 17, Christ said, sanctify them by, my, by, by what? Through thy truth, your word is truth. 
So it is through the Bible that power comes down to sanctify and make people holy. To show us in detail how God wants us to live and causes us to cry out to the power to live, you know, to live that way. You know, we learn that, that you know, through the word, the devil knows that we're going to learn everything that he's pulling off. That's why he hates the word. Do you know that most people who do not know the word don't, haven't even read it? They don't know what it says. People who read the Bible don't talk that foolishness. It is people that don't read it. People who just heard a few clever sayings and a few blasphemous sayings and they think that they're smart quoting them. You know, people actually think it is smart to doubt God. Let me ask you a question. Is it smart to go to hell? See, people don't know God's word and yet they judge the word all the time. You know, it is amazing how much people know about other things how, how li- and, and then how little they know about the Bible. Have you ever watched Jeopardy? You see all these people, you know, giving all kinds of details about sports and science and a- industry and, a- a- and all, their, all the other things, right? And then somebody throws them a Bible question, who was so- swallowed by the whale? They don't know. And some of you are looking at me like you don't know either. <laughs> okay, well, let me, let me continue. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah. And yet, these people are, are sitting there in judgment of the Bible. You know, I heard a story of two, um, two senators that got into an argument about the Bible. And one of them said, you know, to the other, you don't know anything about the Bible. I'll bet you $25 that you cannot repeat the Lord's Prayer. And the other senator said, you know what, I'll take that bed. He said, all right, say it. He said, now I lay down to sleep. I pray my Lord, my soul to keep. And when he got through it, the other senator said, okay, man, you, you earned your money. I, thought, I just didn't think that you knew it. <laughs> Folks, we're condemning the Bible and, 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 and these people don't even know anything about it. I'm going to tell you something else. People condemn the Bible because the truth of the Bible condemns them. One reason why people are so busy picking on the Bible apart, picking the Bible apart, is because they they won't hold on. They want to hold on to sins which the Word of God condemns. This is the problem right now. But I want to settle one thing right from the get-go. Right from the get-go. I, if you don't hear anything else from the sermon, if you don't take anything else from the, I want you to read this text with me, all right? Psalm 119, verse 89. Psalm 119, verse 89, the Bible says this. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Say amen. amen. Now, that's, that's a solid rock. Forever thy word is settled in heaven. Matthew 24, 35, this is what Jesus said. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Amen? Amen. Now, folks, these are the caves of Qumran where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And if you are a Bible student, you you should know that the Dead Sea Scrolls were found on, on, on all clay jars, you know, scrolls made out of leather containing the Word of God dating back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Among these documents or these fragments, the most complete text of the, is of the book of Isaiah. All right? Here's the picture. And it was of leather scroll 40 feet long and 11 inches high. And when the scientists sprayed it and moistened it and opened it up, they looked right in the middle of the book of Isaiah, right in the middle of that scroll. And, and, and what do you suppose that they read? Isaiah 40 and verse 8, which it says this, the grass wither it. The flower, what? Fadeth, but the word of God shall stand, what? Come on and say amen out there. See, friends, people were impressed that these bits of scripture have been there for hundreds of years. But I got news for you. The word of God goes all the way back to the beginning, and it stretches all the way into the future. And the circle will be closed in eternity. The word of our God shall stand, what? Forever. Come on forever it shall never pass away though the heavens and earth will pass away 
That's proof of his divinity, of his extraordinary origin. Tradition have dragged a, a, a grave, had dug a grave for the Bible, but the Bible still endures. You see, intolerance has lightened fires for the scriptures. You know, we were talking about this in, uh, in the youth uh, you know, Bible study. We, they actually threw the Bible in, in, in fires, huge bonfires. But the scripture endure. You know, people don't like it, but it lives. People, people argue with it, but it lives. People lie about it, but it stands forever. People twist it and misconstrue it, but it will stand forever. The word of God will not pass away. I mean, try to tell our elderly people, there's nothing to the word of God. Try to tell somebody who has had the grace to read it and then try, and then, and then try it. They will tell you, I tried it, I read it, I believe it, and I have decided to put it to the test. And God kept the promise. You see, he keeps his word. He will come through every single time. I want to tell you something. Um, in, in my Google uh, Books library, I have a book. It's called by, by Lockyer. It's called The Last Words of Saints and Sinners. You know, the man I actually, you know, comb through the libraries of the world to find out about death scenes of famous, famous people. And he wrote it down simply for his doctoral thesis. The last recorded words of famous people who die. And the most amazing thing to me in, in the book is that all these big shots, these smart Alex, infidels, atheists, die screaming the name of God. Voltaire once said, in 50 years, the Bible is going to be an exploded book. Well, Voltaire had been there for a long, long time, and the Bible is still the world's bestseller. It is read in more languages than any other book under the sun. Voltaire, uh, you know, died a liar. But that's not all. He died calling on the name of God and saying that he was going to the realm of the damned. If you go to New York, you can find the, the home of uh, Thomas Paine, the great American patriot. Thomas Paine was an unbeliever. He wrote the book, The Age of Reason. But then all Thomas Paine came, to, they, they came down to dying. Uh, by the way, we almost go there sooner or later. And Thomas Paine was quoted in, the, in this book, The Last Words of Saints and Sinners, uh, uh, screaming the name of Jesus. In fact, he would give the world's you know, he said, I will give the world if I had them, if the age of reason had never been written. He said, Lord, have mercy on my soul. Have mercy on my soul. Folks, when someone presses a dying pillow without God, there is a difference in the way they die and in the way a saint dies. A nurse was in, in the ICU unit of a dying man, and when that man finally came to dying, she came out there very shaken, perspiring all over the place. She said, as long as I live and practice nursing, I don't want to ever again take care of a dying unbeliever because it is a hopeless death. It is a death of fear. It is a death of struggle. But on the other hand, I've seen saints die. <laughs> and I've seen ordinary people die who knew God. And I've seen people die who simply believed the Bible and they rested on the Bible. Right. They were able, even in death, to smile. Right. The frown was gone. There was a peace on, you know, on their faces. And they laid their head down on the pillow and, and Jesus just bent over and kissed them to sleep. Right. You see, it makes a difference when you die, whether you, are, whether you have the word of God or not. Amen? Now, you may be saying, I don't understand everything in the Bible, Mario. Well, I don't know either. And by the way, I don't know anyone who does. I got certain heroes of mine. Let me, let me introduce them to you. First one, Martin Luther. Yeah, the, the founder of the Lutheran Church. One of my heroes. I love this man. I love study about him. The next one, Paul. See, Two intellectuals. Maybe that's why I like him so much, because I'm not. 
But anyways, it, Paul is considered the master intellect, the great preacher of, of the apostolic age. And yet, Paul said in Romans 11 and verse 33, all the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgment and his ways past finding out. Paul said God's wisdom is unsearchable. His ways are past finding out. Paul actually admitted that he could not understand everything about God. But that did not stop his faith. And that which he did understood, guess what he did? He believed it with all his heart. And when Paul came down to dying, he said in Romans to his Roman captors, For I know in whom I believe. And I'm persuaded that he's able to keep me that which have committed unto him against, a, a what? against that day. And then my, this, look, look, my brother Peter, you know, him and Paul have some issues, right? So my brother Peter in 2 Peter wrote this about Paul. As also in his, all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. So Peter said, I cannot even understand Paul. He said, there are some things that are hard to understand. Friends, I stand up here preaching Sabbath after Sabbath, and I preach as one who believes because I do believe. But I don't understand everything. In fact, if I did, I think it would be a little, a little danger to myself. For what? Path, the path of the just is what? It's the shining light that shineth more and more unto a perfect day. See, in our ability to understand does not depend so much on our brains as on our hearts. You get that? See, people always say to me, I'll make a decision when I actually memorize the Bible. Good luck. This is the issue. We're, we're, we're actually mixing knowledge with salvation. See what I'm saying? You know who did that too? The Sanhedrin. I told you they memorized Genesis all the way to Deuteronomy, and yet they killed the Son of God. They rejected him. Amen? Now the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 14 that spiritual things are what? Spiritually discerned. When we seek the Lord humbly, when we recognize him as God, when we plead for understanding through the Holy Spirit, he gives us light as we are able to absorb it. And for the rest of our lives, we are going to be learning. Amen. But what about those who doubt the word of the Lord? What proof do I have to provide to reasonable men and women uh, that, that we can trust God's word? Let me tell you what happened to me. I was called to preach when I did not want to preach. And when I did, I, I literally just sat down by myself and I had a little talk with God. I, he knew how I felt. He knew that I have a, my heart set on something else. And I said, Lord, I am getting ready for the ministry. And I told him, I want to make sure that, that, that I'm about to preach because I cannot preach something I do not believe. I want a message. I want to be able to tell people something that makes sense. I want, some, I want truths so accurate as 2 plus 2 is 4. And it wasn't long after that that I was sitting in class, one of my professors studying Bible prophecy. And I got, I, 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 you know, it clicked on my head. Here are things that God has said hundreds of years before, and they came to pass accurately. In fact, no, no, mathematically accurate. Hundreds of years later. And I said, yes, sir, this is my kind of God. A God who can tell the future. And it happened just as he did, just as he did said it was going to be. And I want you to just jot this text down. Jot it down. Isaiah 41 verse 21. Okay. Now here's God. Here's God's challenge to the, to the unbelievers. To the atheists. To the agnostics. And to whoever is an unbeliever. 
Listen to what he says. Isaiah 41, verse 21. I don't want to get this wrong. This is what he says. Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Now, I need you to get this because this is how reasonable God is. He doesn't just throw around his arbitrary mind and shuts people out of the way. He said in Isaiah 1, come now, let us reason together. And in this chapter, he says, produce your cause, saith the Lord. Now, you have something that you believe. You have some idea. Let us hear it. Produce your cause. Bring forth your strong reasons. If you make up your mind not to believe God, you ought to have a strong reason. And I like, I like to give you a warning. You better have a strong reason. Amen? So God says, okay, let's hear your side. Bring forth your strong reason. Look at verse 22. Let them bring, forth, bring them forth and show us what shall happen and let them show the former things that we may consider them and know the latter and end of them or declare us things to come. So, and here's God's challenge. This is just getting, getting, laying the groundwork. In verse 23, listen to what he says to Isaiah. Show the things that are come hereafter that we may know that you are God. Amen? And that's God's challenge to the smart, alecky generation of today that denounces the sure word of God. God says, hey, no problem, you know. I have spoken, I, I, I have spoken to them gods. Now, if you are smart enough to come up with something equal to what I have come up with, then you are God. Let me see your reason. You tell us that what's going to happen in the future. And if it happens, then we'll know that you are God. And that includes those who ride the Zodiac, fortune tellers, powder sprinklers, tea leaf readers, fortune cookie bakers, necromancers, spirit mediums. Are you listening to what I'm saying? God says, all of you who claim to have the wisdom superior to that what is found in the word of the Lord, let me hear your side. Show us what's going to happen in the future that we may know that you are gods. And Newcastle actually collected all of these major predictions that they actually do in the beginning of the year. He collected 250 of them, the so-called prophets all around America, who are getting rich with that deception, by the way. Yeah, you know, I, I read it, uh, serious exam, if you put it on, California psychics. And he began to study these predictions and see how many of them happened. Do you know how many came to pass? Six. I can do better than that just by guessing. And yet some of the psychics are rich. Some of them are, are protégés of congressmen and senators. Some of them are honored in their communities. God says, if you have it, let us examine it. And if it happens the way that you say, then we'll know that you are God. Have you ever heard the sickening cliche that I always hear so much today, especially by my young people? Mario, I just have to discover myself. What? And it really gets on my nerves. I'm sorry. You just got to pray for me. There are people in our society who are taking drugs. And if you ask them, why are you doing that? Oh, I just want to expand my mind so that I may discover who I am. You know, we got people today who are involved in all kinds of immorality trying to discover who they are. Do you know that the Bible has already told me who I am? See, the, the, the Word of God tells me where I came from. It tells me that I was created in the image of God. And when I get, get, get it from the Bible, I not only know who I am, but I know where I came from, but I also know that I don't have to have an inferiority complex. I'm not inferior. I don't care what color a man is. He's just a man. 
And I got that from my Bible. See, the Bible tells me about my past too. You know, then the Bible also actually tells me why I am here. And it offers solutions for today. The Bible gives me directions for the best possible life right now. And even if there are no heavens hereafter, the Bible gives me the best prescription for a good life. And then the Bible tells me where I'm going. <laughs> if I'm faithful, I have a hope for the future. If I'm unfaithful, I'm going to hell. So all these things are clear from the word of God. And yet people are there ruining their lives. And the excuse is, I'm just trying to discover who I am. You tell them to read the Bible and they'll say, I don't understand the Bible. And yet they can understand tea leaves and rabbit's foot. I'm just trying to be practical. Isn't that ridiculous? You know, and unbelievers, <laughs> I got to tell you this. Yeah, I have time. Uh, Dwight Moody was preaching one day and an unbeliever came to him. I said, you know, the problem, you know, the problem with Christian preachers today is that they preach a lot of things, but they don't know everything that the Bible says. And Dr. Moody, you know, came in and said, you know what, let's go out to dinner. And Moody said to him, you like fish? He's like, oh, yeah, man, this fish is really good. He said, do you eat the bones? No. And Moody said, but what do you do with them? He said, well, I take them out and put it on the edge of the plate. Then what do you eat? He said, I eat the meat, the good part. Moody said, well, that's the way I study the Bible. I don't pick bones. I take that which is good, which affects my life, which helps me walk uprightly, which expands my mind and creates intelligence. The part that shows me Jesus and his shed blood, that's the meat. And I live, leave the bones for people like you. Friends, I just want you to follow me carefully. Now, we're going to touch on some little history here on this night of the unbeliever. You know, from grade school, that there was a time when everybody believed that the world was flat. In fact, the <laughs> see, I didn't want to go there, Sister Joe. But since you mentioned it, there was, there was one great philosopher who first espoused this idea that the world was round and he was thrown in prison and made to recant the idea. He was actually a laughing stock of the world. I, 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 you know, I think now we, we have concluded that the earth is round, even though there are people who still think that the world is flat. You know, I got, I got on a plane. I, take it, I took it in Dover Air Force Base, and I actually flew all the way to South Korea and then right back to Dover Air Force Base. And I can tell you today, the earth is round. As a matter of fact, have you seen the Virgin Galactic stuff? Yeah, they, they go up there and you see that uh, to the stratosphere, you can see the curve of the earth. The, the earth is round. But there was a time that it was dangerous to say that. Okay, now, for, uh, but long before they actually study all that stuff, my Bible says in Isaiah 40 and verse 22, it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. Come on, let's say amen out there. Why are you all quiet? Stop writing it down. I said, I'm going to tell her this. No. <laughs> now, if unbelievers and doubters were simply, be, if it's just simply believing the word of God, they would have known this a long time ago. Not only that, but we read in Job 22 and verse 14, talking about God, it says, and he walketh in the circuit of heaven. By the way, if you look at the word circuit in the dictionary, it means a roughly circular line, route, a movement that starts and finishes in the same place. The earth is round. And the Bible says, that it is round for hundreds and hundreds of years. And, but man made this discovery, but you know, usually these discoveries man made are simply those things they are catching up with. See, the Bible has said it a long time ago. Not only that, 
But there was a time when scientists believed that the moon was larger than the sun. And then one day they discovered that they were wrong. And then they got some, you know, because they got those telescopes right out there, yeah. And they saw that the moon was only about 250,000 miles out there, but that the sun was 95 million miles out there. And the sun is so much larger than the moon, there's no need to even discuss it comparatively. But don't you know that in the book of Genesis, that, that's way back in the beginning, right? The first book of the Bible says this. That God made the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. If people would just read the Bible, they could have avoided all this mess. Trying to go to Mars to discover water. See, unbelievers ought to listen to the word of the Lord. In fact, 2 Peter 3 and verse 10 that they will come when the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And for a long time, those of us who preach actually the end of the world were laughed at. Oh, there's some things that will, will burn, they say, that will not burn at all. Mario, rocks don't burn. Those buildings that we made out of rock and stone, cement, Mario, they won't burn. They marvel at these, you know, buildings, Right? But then came the explosion of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and rocks did melt and still did burn and actually ran down like water. Folks, when God says something, you got to take it to the bank. When God says something, you can count on it. And everybody who believes that, say amen. amen. You see, 700 years before Jesus was born, a prophet was inspired of God to name the actual town that he will be born in. Micah 5, verses 2 through 7, Jesus will be born in Bethlehem. The text says, Bethlehem Ephatra. See, that's like saying, Germantown, Maryland. Bethlehem of Ephrat. It, it, it's just, if you just say Germantown, there are dozens of Germantowns around the country. Germantown, Connecticut, Germantown, Illinois, Germantown, California. But when you say, Pennsylvania too, but when you say Germantown, Maryland, you put a pin on it. Send me a pin. Germantown, Maryland. So when the prophet named Bethlehem, he just did not say just any Bethlehem. If he would have just said Bethlehem, some might have thought that he was talking about Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. He said Bethlehem, Ephrata. Bethlehem of Ephrat. And then he says, The thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall he come. Folks, 700 years before the fact, God named the town. And he picked, it, he picked out a little town. And God said, out of that little town, that little town is going to be in prophecy. And today we sing, Oh, little town of Bethlehem. Huh? But you know what is amazing? The amazing thing is God stuck out his neck on his word. See, <laughs> see this is the amazing thing. It's just, we don't think about these things. I do. I'm weird. God picked a town 700 years before Christ was born. And you and I, we, we, you know, if you and I were, God, you know, God, thinking the way we think, we would have actually chosen a virgin in Bethlehem, right? But God didn't do that. God chose a virgin in Nazareth. <laughs> Come on. I want you to think about this. And from Nazareth to Bethlehem is about 90 miles. Taking the route that Mary and Joseph took, right? So God chooses a town 90 miles away from the town he named 700 years before. That's sticking out your neck. See, God was not even playing in his safe. See, if God chooses a town 90 miles away, then the next reasonable thing to do will be as soon as he told you the town, Mary and Joseph would have left and settled in where? Bethlehem. Well, he didn't. They kept the little house in Nazareth. One month, two months, three months, six months, seven months. Babies come in nine months. 
eight months, nine months. The baby is due any day, and Mary is 90 miles away. And she has to either go to Bethlehem or the Bible is a lie. And if you find in it a lie, I'm quitting this thing called ministry right now. In fact, I'll quit the church. I'm not going to hang my soul on a book that cannot be trusted. Amen? Amen. Now, how in the world, ladies, will God get a pregnant woman 90 miles away when they don't even have helicopters or planes or ambulances and cars? They didn't even have a steam, you know, a stream that they could just take a canoe down the stream. Not only that, but what kind of a man, man, would make his wife to travel 90 miles when she's expecting any day on top of a donkey? Now, you read it every Christmas, right? Luke 2 says, in the days of Caesar Augustus, there went forth a decree that all the world should be taxed. Friends, when a decree is, it comes forth from Caesar, it is irrevocable. He did not care about Jewish women. He did not care about anybody except Romans. You either did it or you were told, or it, what, you, did it, you did what you were told or you died. So whether he wanted to do it or not, Joseph had to take his wife. Are you following me? Yeah. So he got his little donkey out, patted it up. And he put his wife on that donkey, and they set out on that trip of 90 miles with his wife, expecting a baby any day. And he had to travel more slowly than everybody else. While everybody, while he was going slowly, everybody was passing them. And when he finally got there, all the hotels were full. And all the rooms in the inns were taken. There were no accommodations. People were even sleeping in the streets and on the tops of the houses. And they, were, they, they, and they were there to obey the decree. The decree that had come from Caesar Augustus. And when Joseph inquired, he was desperate. He was pleading. What, was he, what's wrong with you, Joseph? My wife is expecting a baby. Well, why did you travel? I had to. Why did you have to? Caesar said so. No, 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 no. God said so. God said, out of the old Bethlehem shall come, shall he come. Christ had to be born there. And when they could not find a room, he went into a stable. And away in a manger, no crib for his bed. The little old Jesus laid down his sweet head, and he laid down his head in Bethlehem. The Bible came true once again. Now, friends, that speaks to my heart. You see, in mathematics... We have what is called the, uh, the law of probability. But then you also have the law of compound probability. I'm a geek, sorry. It, it, it is really the law of things that happen by chance, okay? And according to the law of compound probability, the chances of Jesus fulfilling that prophecy uttered 700 years before will be one chance in one with 100 zeros behind it. You cannot even spell that out. I, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't mind taking a chance in one or two or one in five. No, no, no. The chances of this happening was one chance in one with 100 zeros. In other words, impossible. And that also speaks to reasonable people. See, when God says the thing will come to pass, and it comes to pass, God says that anybody else who doesn't believe his word, then you'll predict the future, and we will know that you are God's. If it comes to pass. Amen? Let's go to another text. The book of Ezekiel 26. I'm just giving you some examples. There's a city mentioned. The city of Tyrus is the old city of Tyre. T-Y-R-E. And at that time, there was a great port city. It was a trade center. It was like the New York of the Middle East. It was prosperous, self-sufficient, proud city. And at the same time, it was a wicked city. Immoral. And finally, God ordered his judgment against that city. And in verse 3 and 5, in 12 and 14 of Ezekiel 26, it says this. I am against thee, O Tyrus, 
and I'm going to destroy your walls, and I'm going to break down your towers, and your city will be cast into the sea. And when you read verses 12 and 14, God says, and they will lay the stones and the dust and the timber in the midst of the water. And you shall, be, you shall be built no more. Now, this was a judgment being pronounced upon a great, big, powerful, rich, prosperous, secure city. And when people heard the prophet, they laughed at him. They made fun of him. They made fun of his family. They made fun of his, of his God. They made fun of everything. And it did not make sense to them at all. Now, nobody who was rational could actually look at this powerful city and believe that it could be destroyed, that it would be cast into the sea. And it wasn't too long after that that the laughter stopped. A Babylonian king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar attacked the city. And when he ravaged the entire city, he left it in ruins. No, it was not fit to live in. It was so ruined that the people who remained moved away and, and left the city in ruins. But it wasn't in the sea. And for 100 years it wasn't in the sea. For 200 years it wasn't in the sea. For 249 years and a half years it wasn't in the sea. For 250 years after Nebuchadnezzar came along, a great military strategy, strategist by the name of Alexander the Great. Have you heard of him? Yeah. He was marching down to that part of the world conquering everything that he actually, uh, you know, that came through his path, he waged war against Phoenicia. And when he came to this area that was in ruins, he looked out into the water. There was a little island out there. The remains of Tyre and, and, and it had gone on this, you know, it, 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 they were actually on this island, and they had built a wall and built a city, and that's where they live. And when he saw, when they saw Alexander, because there was some water between the two. Guess what? They slammed the, the gate shut, and they said, I'm not going to surrender. Alexander said to his soldiers, build me a crossway. Make me a road to the island. And I know you're going to actually build it out of, I know exactly what they're going to use. You're going to take that old city of Tyre, where the ruins have been laid for 250 years. And they started picking up those stones and those columns one by one and laying it out for a long time. And they hauled them out and dumped it into the sea. And after they had actually scraped the city and dumped it in the sea, they went back and scraped the dust and the rocks in order to make the, 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 the pathway smooth for Alexander's horses. And when they finished, 250 years after the prophecy, Tyre what not only was destroyed, it was inside the Mediterranean Sea. And the dust and the stones thereof are also in the Mediterranean Sea. Amen? Let's get this straight, folks. The laughter stops when God speaks. Another example, Capernaum. Jesus said in Matthew 11, Woe well unto you, though you be exalted under the heavens, you will be brought down to hell. What's wrong with Capernaum? Jesus said, if Sodom has seen what you have seen, the mighty works that I have done, if they have seen, if, if, if they have been done in Sodom, Sodom would have repented. But you have seen Capernaum. You have watched me heal the sick. You have watched me raise the dead. And you still won't believe that shall be brought down to hell. This morning, while we sit here on, uh, in the north shores of the Sea of Galilee, are the ruins of Capernaum, never rebuilt. The town that was blessed with the presence of God. When the Bible speaks, you better count on it. And we need to get that straight. I just want to give you one more illustration. Let's talk about Jerusalem. Okay, um, Jesus also blessed that city. He preached there. He healed the sick there. He taught the doctors there. One day, he drove the, 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 the money changers out of the temple, and he said, you shall not make my father's house a den of thieves. But they would not obey. They would not believe. They turned against Jesus because he told the, he told the truth. 
They will not let him preach in the temple anymore. In fact, they rejected him altogether. And they taught the people to reject him. And like we said last Sabbath, finally, it, 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 the time was winding down. Jesus sat on the hill and he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I would gather you, you, you as, a, as a hen gather his chickens, but you would not let me. Therefore, your house is left unto you desolate. And like we mentioned last week, the disciples heard this and they came to him running. Lord, Lord, Lord what do you mean about that? Jesus said, you shall not see ye not all these things there shall not be left unto you one stone standing upon another they all shall be thrown down finally when Jesus said that it didn't make sense except to those who believe the word of God for Jerusalem was the height of his, at the height of his glory the domes in the temple were gold plated the temple was refurbished in white marble um, shipped all the way from Rome by King Herod it was the most beautiful thing in the world at that time. And it was so white and so bright that, it, it, that the sun, when it hit it, it seemed like they were on fire. The Jews were proud of it. They thought that it would stand forever. And yet here is Jesus saying, not one stone will be left standing upon another. So 40 years after Christ said that, Titus of Rome marched into Jerusalem. He torn the gates down. He began to hew down indiscriminately the old, the young, the females, and, uh, male and female. He killed even the animals. And the remnants of Jerusalem ran into the temple and shut the doors. Josephus stood on a block on the outside of the temple pleading for the Jews to surrender. But they would not. The general has promised to spare the temple if you come out. But they would not surrender. They stayed in there until they were so hungry that they began to eat their belts and their sandals. Folks, I'm just telling you history. Finally, a prophecy uttered by, the, by Moses in the book of Deuteronomy came, came to pass. The Jews stayed there and got so hungry, women took their babies and roasted them on altars of fire and slice their flesh like slicing a turkey. They ate their own children in fulfillment to a prophecy uttered 1,400 years before. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Finally, when they would not surrender, the Romans broke through and they, 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 with their short swords and they began to kill everything in sight. And they slew so many people that the blood ran down the steps the marble steps. And when it was all over, the temple was set on fire. Watch me now. The temple with those cedar ceilings and cedar walls that came from Lebanon. And those things were aged and cured and they began to burn. And the whole temple caught on fire. And finally, those golden domes turned red hot. And the heathen gathered on the hillside and they saw what was happening. And they cried out, Ichabod! Ichabod, the glory has departed. 97,000 Jews were taken back to be fed to the lions in Rome. And hundreds upon hundreds of thousands died in the carnage. But Jesus says, your house shall be left unto you desolate. But he also said, not one stone will be left standing upon another. Historians record that, that, that when they, the fire had cooled off, because there was so much gold in the temple, it had to be melted. It had to, it, 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 that had been melted, it ran down into the masonry. And in order for the looters to get the gold, they took chisels and hammers and dislodged the stones and took them one by one to get the gold. And thus the word of the Lord came to pass exactly. Glory to God. His word is true. And it will stand forever. He said in his word, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Take it to the bank. So I believe what God says, don't you? People tell me, why do I repeat all the time Proverbs 16, 25? There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. Friends, let me tell you why respectfully. Don't 
ever stand your wisdom up against the word of God, you will not win. Men have despised the word, but have, have to, have, the, I, I have, to have acknowledge, they have to acknowledge that it was true. Don't let your judgment, your opinion stand between you and it thus saith the Lord. The quicker you learn that, the sooner you're going to actually have peace in your heart. I am a man who had to learn that. I learned that the simplest and best and easiest thing to do is to let God be true and let everybody else be a liar. You think I'm going to let YouTube tell me oh, this and that? Oh, man, shut up. That's why I want, to, I want you to check on me when I preach, right? Don't just take my word for it. Go home, study it, look in your Bible. If it's not there, I'm a liar, and you should not come back. Amen? Amen. Yeah. So, so let God be true. You know, we, we got people so foolish and so fickle that they will actually read a thing in the Bible as plain as their noses. And then they go and ask their preacher if God is telling the truth. <laughs> Folks, you don't need to check on God with a preacher. You need to check the preacher with God. Got it? Then we get into this nonsensical stuff about evolution. We came from monkeys. Well, let me tell you something. There is not one belief, iota, of me about evolution. Why? We came from monkeys. It just was an excuse to act like a monkey. I'm going to leave it there. There's another sermon coming. There's some who read the story of Jonah in the whale and they laugh. And I want to tell you something. It is not so incredible for me to think that God can make a big fish, a, a, a fish big enough, excuse me, to carry a man when a man can make a supersonic plane that is faster than a bullet. What do you say? Amen. Uh, thank you. To say two of you say amen. What do you say? Amen. You see, God ought to be able to do more than a man can do. Somebody reads one day, Jesus walked on water, and they laugh. They say, nobody can walk on water, Mario, and yet men have walked on the moon. They got in these rockets, right? Out of to outer space, 250,000 miles away, they climb out of that ladder and put footprints on the moon. And if men can do that, don't you think that God can walk on water? I mean, after all, he created water. See, God is not a man. He is God. See, friends, people are in darkness because they want to be in darkness. But it's up to you. Which way do you want to go? Darkness or light? It's up to you. It's up to me. It's like we said during the Holy Spirit series. We, you have to make that decision daily. All you need to know is what God says. Amen? You see, I might not have the answers, but as soon as I understand what God says, I'm in the light. I'm not afraid of the light. I'm not afraid of the Bible. Great men of all ages, all their greatness that for some kind of faith in the word of God. Abraham Lincoln got so tired of hypocrites who talked about the Lord, but then kept black folks in slavery, huh, that he would not even go to church anymore. But he believed in the, in the Lord. And if you don't believe it, read his writings. He, he was quoting the word of God. You go downtown to the Lincoln Memorial and stand what is called the most beautiful memorial on earth. And they turn to the right and you read Lincoln's second inaugural address. He pays homage to God of our fathers of the, in, in the mighty address. Folks, people who amount to something are people who are influenced by the word of God. Huh? Booker T. Washington. A man for his time. A great man who believed in the word of God. A revolution never could have gotten off the ground in America had there not been a man who believed in the word of God. Dr. Martin Luther King, we just celebrated him. In Atlanta, Georgia, a certain preacher was on the radio. 
He was blessing white people with a hatred and attack that would make anyone tremble. In that same afternoon, Dr. King stood up and preached, and the first thing that he uttered said, love your enemy. You have to do good to this man who despitefully used you. Turn your other cheek, he says. Nonviolence, he said, is not only a way, it is the only way. Where did he get that? He studied the philosophy of what? Mahatma Gandhi, but he was also a Christian preacher. Uh, and he read those words from Christ himself. God, see, good men have nearly always been men who have faith in the word of God. And today, that's the book of all books. And now, having said that, it is time for us to at least study God's word before we start passing judgment. It is time for us to look in the word of God and see what God says to us. I want my young people to know that it is not a dull study. No, 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 no. Whatever you want to know, if you want history, it's there. If you want adventure, it's here. If you want portraits, it's here. If you want romance, it's there. Whatever it is you enjoy, it is in the word of God. See, you never eat about women eating babies. It's here. And I'm going to watch days of our lives. I love soap operas, and you know it. I do. Sorry. I do. All right? I don't watch them anymore. I read the word of God. It's the best soap opera in the world. The difference is the truth. It speaks to the soul, and it has power in it to cleanse the mind. You study God's word, you pray over it, you see the difference in your life. Because there is power in the word. And it is time for us to get back to the Bible. Basic training. You never had it so good as when you begin to study the word of God. And when you begin to study it, and then you don't understand it, you pray about it. You have something else going for you. Not only have you read the word of God and understand it, but then the Lord through his Holy Spirit will enlighten your mind and will give you insights to other, what other people don't understand. You're going to be able to look out and face the future unafraid. Because you hit the word in your heart and you might not, so that you might not sit against God. We stand in need of the word today. Germantown, Maryland needs the word of God. America needs the word of God. If we take heed of the word of God, it will be safe to walk the streets of our community. If people would just hear the word of God, racism and bigotry would disappear. If people would take heed of the word of God, we will all be brought together in one common denomination. And that's what we need. When we study the word, it cleans you up. My professor gave us an example. It will, it will actually clean you up. Not only that, it will brush your teeth. It will comb your hair. It will actually just tidy up your house. huh? The word of God and the power of the gospel will brush everything that you need. It will make you clean, attractive, and yet modest. You look like somebody when your life is under the influence of the word of the Lord. You want to see a contrast? There's another side. Thank God for the word this morning. Amen? Thank God because it is time. At the time of danger, it points the way. We can go to bed tonight with all the strategic arms and all the threatenings of, a, of, a, of an atomic bomb or a nuclear bomb. I can go to bed right now and go to sleep like a baby. And That's what we need. Because God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. The only place you're going to find that is in the word of God. And the devil figures, if I can just get the people to disobey and disregard and ignore the word, they're going to never find that God, that, that, that God said, whosoever, whosoever believeth should not perish, but have everlasting life. The devil knows what he's doing when he belittles the word. And he creates doubt. He knows that you're not going to find a savior if you, don't, if you ignore the word. He knows that Jesus died in vain and hung on the cross for nothing unless you're going to study the word and believe in the word. 
So here I was. Speaking to my friend. And I said, well, let me ask you a question, something. When we were zeroing our weapons, we made one click, up and down, left and right, to zero the weapon for you. He said, yes. It's like, when you press the trigger, do you believe that the actual bullet was going to hit what you actually aimed for? Yes. And I wonder, what happens if some wind came up? Will it deviate the actual bullet? Yes. And I said to him, what if I tell you that no matter how much it winds and hurricanes and tornadoes will come up, God is going to hit the mark every single time. He's like, I can count on that shot. And I was like, me too. I can count on it every single day. Folks, it is time for us as Adventists, as visitors, as Christians, to start believing the word of God all the way. Amen. Not just what is convenient. All the way. And if that is your desire, stand to your feet. Father in heaven, I didn't just write this sermon for my friend. This is the foundation of it all. This is, this, this is the basics of Christianity. Do we believe what the word says or do we believe what man says? That's it. And Lord, I tell people, if you're going to believe what man says all the time, you may just, might as well just hang it up. Give up. Because the just lives only by faith in the word of God. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So Father, right now, right here, we're standing because it is time. It is time to put all of our hopes on the word of God to believe it all the way regardless of what other people say you're going to believe it because you wrote it and everything that you wrote has come to pass so father right here right now maybe there's someone that have maybe question I done it Lord question and when I see all the people and everything else I have question is it really, is it, is it really going to come to pass, Lord? And the answer, Lord, is yes. Just wait on me, Mario. There's only a few things that need to take place, and my, my second coming is short thereafter. So, Lord, I wonder if someone here, their faith is dwindling. They're really weak in their faith. If that is you this morning, let's raise our hands unto the Lord. Say, Lord, here's our hands. You see us. Let us go back to reading the word of God. Your word, your word, and your word alone. Give us the strength to listen to your word and to believe in your word. That no matter what happens, Lord, we will stand strong and firm on the word of God. So, Father, give us the strength. Give us the courage to even stand against our family, against our job, even if it is against the government. But we will stand by your truth and only by your truth. So, Lord, thank you. You may put your hands down. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your prophecies. And thank you for what is coming. And we ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You may be seated.